Okay, good evening, everybody. Tonight's shear is about pleasure. We're in the parshas now of uh, Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah. The tachlis of the Bria, the purpose of the creation, contrary to what people might think, is not to be a tzaddik. God did not create the world for people to be tzaddikim. The tachlis of the Bria, the purpose of the creation, is not to sit and learn Torah. Hashem did not create the world for the Torah to be learned. Hashem didn't create the world for, the, for us to do mitzvahs. The tachlis of the Bria, the purpose of the creation, is for us to have pleasure. Mr. Hashem says this. This world according to Judaism, is all about pleasure. And that pleasure, as he says, the true pleasure, of which no other pleasure can compare with that, is the pleasure of being close to Hashem. That's the purpose of the creation, that a man should have pleasure, and that's Lahanos, Lahanos, um, the word, the only reason the world was created was for man to have pleasure on Hashem, from Hashem, being close to Hashem, to bask in the radiance of the Shechina. That's the way the Mesut Hashem starts, also the Derech Hashem. That is the basic principle of Judaism. That's why Hashem created the world. And the world, the way we get to that pleasure is through doing the mitzvahs, is through being a tzaddik, is through learning Torah. But that's not the end. That's the means. <coughs> it's axiomatic that nothing can exist in this world unless it has a spiritual counterpart in the upper worlds. That's a mystical concept, I guess. There's an idea of, for example, Yerushalayim Shalmato, uh, Jerusalem, the, low, the uh, lower Jerusalem, and the upper Jerusalem. There's a... Everything in this world has to have a spiritual counterpart, and it can't exist unless it has a... Everything, a spiritual counterpart in the words ab worlds above. That spiritual counterpart, so to speak, is the thing that gives it chius, gives it life in this world. Nothing can exist in this world which is purely physical. It has to have an infusion of ruchnius, of spirituality, and the eventual physical existence in which we perceive in this world is the result of a chain that stretches from the highest worlds down to this lowest of worlds. If something does not have a spiritual source, by definition it can't exist. Trees, plants, animals, a watch. The basic building blocks of the creation are spiritual. <coughs> That's how Hashem created the world. And even evil, the existence of evil, we'll come back to this maybe a little bit later, has to have some kind of spiritual source. So, as we said at the beginning, since the basis of the creation, the purpose of the creation is pleasure, and the neshama, the soul of a person, was the creation which was designed to experience that pleasure, then the neshama has to be made in such a way that it appreciates this pleasure which is closeness to Hashem, the vacus, closeness to Hashem. In other words, since the, the ultimate, pu ultimate purpose of creation is to have pleasure, to have this spiritual pleasure, to be close to Hashem, that's, so to speak, the lingua, the lingua franca, that's the language of the spiritual world. The reason why the creation exists is for pleasure. That's the basic element of the spiritual world, pleasure. So therefore, that must be etzel u the parallel in this physical world of that spiritual existence 
all has to, also has to be pleasure. And that is why pretty much everything in this world result, revolves around one kind of pleasure or another. The only reason this world is based, the physical world is based on pleasure, all kinds of physical pleasures, is because this world is no, no more <coughs> than a, a parallel, the lowest stop on this enormous chain which extends to the highest, region, the region, highest region, regions of creation. And seeing as the whole world, that highest of levels was created only so that man could be dovik in Hashem, could have the pleasure of being close to Hashem. Lahanas beziv shechinoso, to bask in the radiance of the shechina, the ultimate pleasure for which man, the world is created, it must be that this lower existence also revolves around pleasure. And this is the reason why the Yetzirah is always connected with pleasure. Ein odem chota ela yeshlo. A person doesn't do an avera unless there's something in it for him. Now that pleasure can take on many different forms. The pleasure of eating, of drinking, of relations, the pleasure of status, the pleasure of stealing money, the pleasure of throwing people down. All of these are pleasurable. Whether they should be pleasurable or not is not the discussion here. Why do people want to see people thrown down? It makes them feel better. <clears throat> Why does a person want to have money? You can't eat money, but you can go get a good steak with it. You can lord it up over other people. <coughs> Where does a person, why does a person want to look where he shouldn't look? One of the challenges of our generation now, which has become so acute with all these phones that we carry around, where it's just one click from something that could be oim v'noira, terrible, shrechlech. Maisa, maybe we could just divert a little bit and talk about Shmir Senayim. If you think about it, the whole idea of Shmir Senayim, the whole idea of looking at something which is going to give you pleasure, that this, if you think about it, the pleasure is very strange. Do you really think when you look where you shouldn't look, you're going to see something new? Something that you haven't seen before? If you analyze it, it's something, it's a Chiddush? No, it's not a Chiddush. The Chazanish says that when a person um, when a person refrains from looking at something which he shouldn't look at, see a person, we tend to think that I'm going to not look at this and I'm going to get, get a reward in Olam Haba. The so Chazanish says that's true, but you also get rewarded in Olam Haba as this as well. Anything that a person refrains, any pleasure in this world that a person refrains from, which is Osa. He will not just get rewarded, we're rewarded on him. <coughs> he will have the same pleasure in a permitted way in due time. Chazanish says this. There's another, and I'm trying to remember the source of this now, it slipped my mind. There's another safer that says when a person doesn't look at something that he shouldn't look at, he's a mis- misgaber, he dom- dominates his Yetzirah. At that moment, he can ask Hashem for anything he wants. I've had the schuss now to be making some um, videos for an organization called uh, the Yamayin, which is really dedicated to producing short videos to help people with Shemir Zanayim. And the first one I made was based on this, um, it'll come back to me who the author of this was, this idea that when you resist the temptation to look at something you shouldn't look, that you can at that moment ask Hashem for anything you want. And he's, this fellow saw this video, and he called up the, the head of the, uh, of the company. Uh, sorry, so he, this, this fellow saw this video, and he called up the, the head of the company and told him this amazing story, which I'll share with you. He said that he saw this video that we put out, and an Nassoyan came along, and I think it was his father at the time, Loaleinu, was undergoing treatment for cancer. And he said to Hashem, Hashem, I'm not going to look at this. I'm, and then the schus, I'm not looking at this. Please send my father before Shalema. 
And he called up and he said, we just got the results back, he's clean. It's amazing, you know, when you're, when you're working in these sorts of inyonim, and a story comes back, back like that. Pleasure. A person wants pleasure. As we said, it has to be that the, the world turns around. Money makes the world go around, but really pleasure makes the world go around. And the reason that has to be is because, as we said before, seeing as the whole purpose of the creation was pleasure, and that spiritual pleasure in the upper worlds of Tevekas and Hashem, so therefore, Zer le'umad Zer. Hashem created everything parallel. There's a, an upper world and a lower world. The upper world is revolves around pleasure. The lower world also runs around pleasure. That's why everything to do with the Yet Sahara, everything the Yet Sahara attempts to trip somebody up is to do with pleasure. The Rambam in <coughs> Morin Avuchim says that if the world was in a state of shleimut, of perfection, the world would be just full of pleasure, of the correct pleasure. Essentially, the world is a wonderful place to be. It's full of food, beauty, it's full of air. All the necessities of life are plentiful. Odom Mesil Shoshama says that Hashem took Adam through the Garden of Eden, the Gan Eden, and he, sees, he says, see how nice are my work. Be careful not to ruin them. A person can ruin this world. Mesil Shoshama describes what I call Jewish ecology. Jewish ecology, ecology basically means that when we do a mitzvah, the whole world is elevated, not just we become elevated, we elevate the physical world. The story of Yaakov Avinu and the stones, which all wanted to become the resting place for the head of the tzaddik. When you saw that the time when he had the dream with the, the ladder of the angels going up and down. And the Pasuk says the following morning it was one stone. They all had this desire to be the stone on which the tzaddik would lay his head. And as a result of that desire that became Echod, one, there was an Achtus. Achtus comes when this world, the Shlemus of this world comes. By our actions. Our actions just don't elevate us. They elevate the world, and unfortunately the reverse is also true. Not only when a person does an Avera, he brings himself down, but he brings the world down with him. <clears throat> Phil Shusharam says that this world, the nature of this world is to be a challenge. A person is in this world to do three things. Uh, la sosas a mitzvahs, to do the mitzvahs. La vodas Hashem, to serve Hashem, which I think probably means davening. And la amod benisoyon, and to stand up to challenges, stand up to tests. Meaning everything in this world, he says, is a challenge. Everything is a challenge to see, can we choose the right direction or not? Everything is a challenge. A challenge, and he says, a person is surrounded by a milchoma panim va'acho, in front of in front of him and behind of him and behind him. There's obvious challenges and challenges which are not so obvious. He says, on the one hand, wealth on the one hand, and poverty in the other. Clearly, the revealed challenge is the challenge of poverty. A person's poor. He has a challenge to steal, to support, to be able to eat. That's a challenge. But riches, what's the challenge of riches? The challenge of riches, that's the challenge which is poniva ocho, that's the, the milchoma that's coming from behind you, is it's very easy to think, bekochi v'otsim yodi. I did it, self-made man.
So, the challenge is to resist the urge to do what Hashem doesn't want to do and to do what Hashem wants us to do. <coughs> yeah, so therefore, just to go into this a bit more, the, the Eight Sahara wants to do, could not w get a person to do an Avera unless it was pleasurable. Why? Because the Matthias of the Neshama is pleasure. And so the only way the Yetzirah can fight the Neshama is with pleasure. Because if it wasn't that the Yetzirah was talking in the language of the Neshama, of course on a very different and a very base level, but then any temptation that the Yetzirah could produce would be overwhelmed by the desire of the Neshama to have the pleasure of being Misanig al Hashem, to have the pleasure of being close to Hashem. And therefore, every attack of the Eight Sahara always comes through pleasure. Hashem made this in exact proportion to that, equal and opposite. Whatever Hashem made in this world that's good, He also provided the means to do the reverse. And that the means to that evil has to be equal and opposite. Otherwise, there'd be no challenge. Yeah. So, Rav, the only good with which uh, the Yetzirah counts is with, with, with pleasure? If that's the only way... The only way the Yetzirah can tempt a person away from the ultimate real pleasure of the Vekas in Hashem is with pleasure. The Yetzirah has to speak the language of the Neshama, so to speak, in order to turn it aside. You know, the Yetzirah is not going to come and tell a person to uh, uh, jump off a cliff. He's not going to get very far with the person, unless, of course, he's Meshuggah. But I'm saying that the, 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 the Yetzirah has to speak that same language. That's why, if you think about it, every challenge that the Yetzirah presents you is some form of pleasure. <coughs> So, if the neshama, uh, sorry, let's just go back a bit. Yeah, so again, the desire for evil always expresses itself in the desire for the pleasure of some kind. Why does a person want to do something wrong? Because he enjoys it. The Gemara says, why do people work, worship a Avodah Zorah? It's very difficult for us to understand the desire for Avodah Zorah. To us, it seems ridiculous, you know, that people would bow down to big oversized dollies. I mean, you know. and yet the Gemara tells us there's a, uh, that says Ravashi, there's a Gemara with Ravashi who says that, um, uh, that the king of Manasseh came to him and he said, had you been allowed, alive in our days, you'd have hooked up your skirts and run off to find the nearest idol to bow down, bow down to. What happened was the Chal Beis, Chazal, um, the, the rabbis at a certain point in history, took, the Gemara says, took the Yetzirah out of two things, out of physical relations and out of Avodah Zorah. After three days, no chicken had laid an egg, and so they put back the desire for Arias in an attenuated form, uh, a less strong form, and we have that to this day. But the desire for Avodah Zorah was never, ever replaced. To understand how Avodah Zorah was, the pleasure, the pleasure of Avodah Zorah, one has to parallel it with the tremendous uh, desire that people have today, we still have today, for, for Arias, for sexuality. I mean, I put it like this, nowadays it's difficult to find an ad on TV, which of course you don't watch, where there's not where the product isn't being sold in some way or other by the lure of either status. And why do people want status, especially men? Because they'll be able to have the woman of their choice. Or why do women want status? Because they'll be fi able to find the man of their choice, some billionaire. Or because if you brush your to teeth with this particular toothpaste, you'll be I I incredibly attractive to the other sex. If you think about it, all advertising is based on sex. It's all based on now, if you take that, 
uh, the equivalent, I mean, it sounds a little absurd, but if you think about it, you would find back in the day, if they had ads back in the day when Avodah Zorah was uh, so powerful, you know, you have some sort of, uh, some, some statue brushing its teeth with, uh, with toothpaste. Oh, wow, you know. I mean, and if you think about it, right, that's, that's, that was the, like, you, you could sell toothpaste with Avodah Zorah. Just like you can, today you can sell toothpaste with sex. And if you think about it, just as absurd as it is when we th- think that you can sell toothpaste with a Bodhisattva, so really that really should alert us, if we're thinking clearly, which of course a lot of time we don't, how absurd it is and how, but again, what's the, what's the underlying principle? Pleasure. Advertising seeks to tap into what a person finds pleasurable. A person wants pleasure. Get this toothpaste and you'll have pleasure. Well, the ple- whatever. Yeah, the point's clear. <laughs> if the neshama was not encased in a physical body, for this, right, theoretically, and, and would function in a way that the neshama functions in the non-physical world, a person would have no interest whatsoever in the pleasures of this world. So the neshama really basically says this. If the neshama was not encased in a body, if the neshama was in this world and it didn't need the body, which of course it does, but if it didn't, and it would function in the way that the neshama does function in the non-physical world, in the spiritual world, then the pleasures of this world would have absolutely zero interest. And you see there are people who manage to elevate themselves to a level where you can tell their status of, evalu- of, elevate, of elevation by what makes them, what gives them pleasure. There are some people who cannot be torn away from learning Gemara. No pleasure in the world. You can. There's a famous story about Moshe Reichman. I think it was Moshe Reichman and Rav Shach Zetzal. And uh, Rav Shach said to Moshe Reichman, who was a very, very big gvir, a big, big donor of tzedakah, enormous. And he said to him, Ramosha, you know, I'm a kaniyu. I, I'm jealous of your olam haba. But you have to be makani me, my olam haza. What did he mean? What was Rav Shach's olam haza? A stender, pretty old stender, a gemara, a glass of latte in a glass, a glass of tea with a, a lump of sugar and a lemon tea. That was his olam haza. And he loved it. It gave him so much pleasure because when the person's on a very physical, high spiritual level, they don't need a lot of physicality. And if you don't need a lot of physicality, your olam hazeh is extremely pleasurable. Because the more you need, the less you have. The less you need, the more you have. Rashach needed very, very little. Big tzaddikim, I mean, there are people walking around the shishiva who, if you look carefully, you will see that they, they need very, very little. And you see that the smile never leaves their faces. And you see that... There's a story about Ravar and Kotler when he was young. They came to him from one of the big universities. I can't remember what it was. They, they knew he was a complete genius. And they said... Um, Come with us to the university. They, you know, they asked him certain questions that they didn't have the answers to, and apparently he answered them. He was a genius, un, unusually, unusual genius. And they said, and he said, I don't want to go. He said, they said, well, if you stay here, if you come to the university, do you realize when, when you part, go away from this world, hundreds of thousands of people are going to come to your to the, your levaya, to your funeral? How many people think you're going to come to come to your funeral when you pass away if you stay here at the yeshiva? As it turned out, probably a couple of hundred thousand people turned up for Aaron's funeral in the end. Okay, the Derech Hashem says that the biggest shlemus that a person can achieve is learning Torah. When Hashem created the world, He created different, what are called hashpa'ot. It's a difficult word to translate into English. It's something like an influence. In fact, the modern Hebrew word uh, shapat is based on uh, Hebraization of the English word influenza, 
<laughs> sort of like, modern Hebrew is very sometimes very strange in the way it goes, like reverse engineering. Because the word in English is influenza, so hashba is an influence. But in its pure sense, as Chazal use it, mystics use it, hashba is a a radiation of 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 um, of energy, which comes from the highest level, and it ends up in this world with us as a kind of perception. There are different hashbar, so to speak, like beams of energy that Hashem aims into this world. Of course, all of these mashalim, these parables, are very inexact and coarse in a sense, but those are the words that we have to use. So that, that there's different hashbar of kedusha, holiness, of tahara, of purity. The highest, the strongest of them is the hashbaa that Hashem excuse me, put into the Torah. <laughs> so, let's put these ideas together. See what we've got. The greatest perfection that can exist in this world, the greatest shlemus that can exist in this world, Hashem put that into the Torah. The essence of this world is to be the saneg al Hashem, to have pleasure literally on Hashem, and to bask in the radiance of the Divine Presence. The Vekus in Hashem, connected to Hashem. So, if the most spiritual thing in the world is the Torah, and the greatest perfection that can exist, the greatest Shleimus is in the Torah, that means that the greatest pleasure must come through Torah, or being connected in some way to the Torah. Rav Yechezkel Sana, at the beginning of Mrs. Dishorim, says that being Dovik and Hashem, this concept we're talking about of, the Mesil Hashem talks, Hashem talks about of being attached, literally Dovik, and modern Hebrew, the word for glue is Devek. So literally, to be stuck to Hashem is the same thing as Shlemus. That is Shlemus, they're the same thing. It's like saying if we could take a, a mashal, that the tachlis, the purpose of everything, is to be close to your Rebbe. But you can't be close to your Rebbe until you know the Torah that he teaches you. So, similarly, the knowledge of the Torah that your Rebbe teaches you and being close to him are the same thing. That's the same thing with our connection to Hashem. If we add to that that the greatest pleasure in the world that can be is being close to your Rebbe, or in this case we're talking about Hashem, it comes out that the greatest pleasure that can be is the knowledge of Torah. Because that is the same thing as being Dovak in Hashem, being close to Hashem. Moshe Chaim Latzato and his another sefer called Das Tfunois, which is a more, more mystical, more openly mystical work, says that Hashem wanted to give a certain amount of the perfection, sorry, a certain amount of the perception of His perfection of his shlemus to his creations. And that's why he created the world. Now, of course, based on what we said before, that's synonymous with pleasure. Hashem wanted to give a certain degree, a certain amount of perception of his shlemus, of his perfection, to his creations. And that's why he created the world. Now, he obviously didn't want to give the perception of all the perfection that he has. Because Hashem's perfection cannot be given over to his creations. We are creations, he's the creator. At a certain level, we will never, ever, ever be able to fathom, to understand Hashem as he understands himself. What can the painting know of the painter? Because Hashem's perfection is self-contained. He is the existence that does not rely on anything else. A creation, by definition, is nivra, created. He's not a boira. Of course, this is beyond our understanding, because if that's so, then where did, where did Hashem come from? But these are questions you can't, under, you can't, under, can't ask, because we can't understand what that means. So similarly, just as we can't understand what it means that Hashem doesn't come from anywhere and He doesn't rely on anything else because everything we know is relative and dependency, so similarly we cannot 
understand Hishlemus. And that's why he can't give us all of Hishlemus. Our understanding of the perfection of something that is not created like ourselves by an outside force is impossible for us to understand. But, as we're saying, Hashem is who He is, is what, who is what He is because of what He is. He's who He is because of what He is. That's Ekiya Hashem Ekiya. We cannot understand this. That's, that kind of shlemus cannot be given over to a created being. So, Hashem wanted to reveal to us, says the Das Funas, a Ketze Katan, a tiny fraction of Ishlemus. That revelation of the tiny fraction of Ishlemus is what we call Olam Haba. The perception that exists in only Olam Haba is only a tiny fraction of the Shlemus of Kodesh Baruch Hu. And in that small amount that he will give us, Bezat Hashem, will be a certain understanding of Hashem's Achtus. And in that will lie all the pleasure that can possibly be. That's all the pleasure there is. That perception in Olam Abba of the Achtus Hashem, that tiny perception that we'll have. Now, it's true that that pleasure is quantitatively limitless. You can, but it's limited in quality meaning we're not going to understand his shlemus. We never can understand more than a tiny, tiny fraction of his shlemus. But the amount of our understanding of that tiny amount is limitless. And that's why in Olam Abba, a person can keep going up and up and up and up on higher and higher levels. But it's only going to be within that limited, as we said before, because that's the nature of being a nivra and, and, and will be creations even in Olam Abba. In other words... It will never be the perception of Hashem Shlemus in its entirety, as we said. It's limitless up to the point that Hashem chose to reveal. Meaning, within that tiny amount that He chose to reveal, the quantity of that amount, the, qu- the quantity of that re- revelation is limitless. But the quality of it will never be more than a fraction. And that's Olam Abba. In that foreverness, that eternity is all the pleasure that can ever be and which consists in our perception of Hashem to the extent that He revealed it to us as creations. So, putting it all together, it comes out like this. All the pleasure that can ever exist in creation, which we said is la no sal Hashem, all the shlemus that there is, which is the same as the as perception of Hashem was revealed by Hashem in this main hashpa that we describe as being the Torah. That's all in the Torah. Again, all of the pleasure that can ever exist in creation, all the shlemus that there is, which is the same as the perception of Hashem, which was revealed by Hashem to the extent He revealed it, is contained in this greatest of all the hashpa'at, all the greatest of influences, of radiances that he put into the world, which is the Torah. Nothing can exist that's not in the Torah. Even the mitzvahs would have no kedusha if they were not written in the Torah. Every mitzvah is novea, derives whatever power it has from the fact it's written in the Torah. If there wasn't a mitzvah of tefillin in the Torah, we'd just be putting, you know, be like putting leather shoes on, on your arm. What makes it, its power only comes from the Torah. And even the Durabonans, which of course are not stated explicitly in the Torah, would have no power, no meaning, if the Torah didn't say, Vasisa kol yerucha, that you should do everything the rabbis teach you or teachers teach you, and lo sasur, don't deviate to the left or the right of what they teach you. Because there are these two lines of Torah in the Raisa. That means that was eight, that means that the that was the Rabbonans also contain Torah. Purim would be nothing. Hanukkah would be nothing. The Tilis Yunayim would be nothing. Where do they get their power to make a person a holier person? Why does a person become holier when he washes his hands three times in the morning? Because it's written in the Torah. A remes, psukim, kutzoshel yud, tagim, halachalamoshmi sinai, anything that is in this world 
that's not in the Torah is not in existence. The Zohar Kodesh says, Istakl kitshbrich b'Torah, u'bara, sorry, Istakl kitshbrich b'Raisa u'bara alma. Hashem looked into the Torah and he created the world. There's nothing in this world which is not contained in some way in the Torah. <coughs> and that's why the Avos were able, the question is, it says the Avos kept all the Torah. How could the Avos keep all the Torah? The Torah wasn't written. So quite simply, the corollary is also true. If there can be nothing in this world which is not written in the Torah, the Avos, by looking into the world, saw Torah. They had the eyes to see all of the Torah that was represented in this world. So even the pleasure, as we said of Olam Azeh, can only exist because somewhere along the line that has to be, there has to be an element of Shlemus also in Hanos Olam Hazeh. Now, we're going to have to explain this because clearly some of the Hanos of Olam Hazeh are not what Hashem wants. But there has to be a degree of Shlemus even in that, and this is where we're going to get into discussion now, a very superficial discussion because we don't I'm not going to go into it too much, but why evil exists. There has to be a certain degree of shlemus even in evil because it couldn't exist otherwise. As we said, everything in this world can only exist to the extent that it has, it's somewhere in the Torah, and the Torah is the Rotz and Hashem. So evil, if for no other reason, that shlemus that is in Olam Hazer may, may only be that it's there to overcome that particular thing to reach a higher madrega. Something can exist in this world for no other reason than it should be, uh, how do you say, avoided, repudiated, pushed aside. Let's try and understand this a little bit on a different level. Everything Hashem axiomatically does is for the good. That's an axiom. Hashem is totally good in every possible way. So the Dust Munas goes into great length and discusses how there can be evil in the world. If everything if emanates from Hashem, who's totally good, how does evil happen? Very superficially, on a very simple level, the answer is that the basis of all evil starts off as good. And then, for example, let's take a moshul, a person is given life, but he doesn't take care of his health. There's a certain lack of strength, let's say, in the, in the good, so he gets sick. It's the same thing with evil. All evil starts off as good, and then somewhere along the line there is something which is called hest upon him, literally the covering of the face, meaning that Hashem did not give the hashpa in the full way. The hashpa is good, but it was given in a way which was not a full way, and therefore, after, after it chains down through all the many, 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 many levels of, of creation, that ends up as something which we call evil in this world. So, everything starts off as being good. But because by nature of the fact that the creation is a creation, and it can never reach the level of the Creator, as we said before, by definition. So therefore that hashpa is in some way limited. That limitation, when it becomes chains all the way down to this world, becomes what we call evil. Okay, it's a very superficial, the, the dust spends many, many pages talking about this. The point is that nothing can exist unless there is some kind of connection to Shlemus, ultimately, at the highest level. That means there has to be a Metzius of Torah somewhere along the line, somewhere in this thing, there's going to be a Metzius of Torah. As we said, Chazal say, The Gemara in Sanhedrin says, there's a Machlokis as to whether three mitzvahs ever were practical, whether they ever, really, ever could be. The three mitzvahs are ben sore umore, which is the wayward son, who exhibits certain signs, he's gluttonous, he's wayward, 
And the Torah says that you put him to death straight away. Because Sof Sof, the Torah was Yored Lasov Daito. The Torah understands that eventually he's going to stand at the Pashas Drochim, at the, uh, how do you say, at the intersection of the road. And Mavakish Limudo, he's going to, he wants to get his, uh, some money to go and buy drugs. Or, and uh, he's going to be, become a highwayman. And when these certain signs emerge in puberty, that the Torah is guaranteeing you that this guy is going to turn out to be a Ben Soramora, and you put him to death. That's a mitzvah. You put him to death immediately. There's another, and again, this, this is the Gemara and Sanhedrin, there's a machlok as to whether these three mitzvahs, that's the first of them, ever, 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 ever took place, ever happened. Was there ever a Matthias where somebody, a Ben Soramora, was put to death? Mach locus. Another one is Irani Dachas. And Irani Dachas is a, is a city which was totally given over to idol worship. There's a mitzvah, mitzvah zase, to burn everything in it. You have to destroy it, raise it to the ground. Nothing left. A bias, a manuga, is a house which has been infected with, um, how do you say, with uh, Nagoyim with taras, which uh, is translated loosely into English as leprosy. Uh, the leprosy that the Torah they translated in is not the leprosy, that uh, the medical disease that we know, because houses don't get leprosy and clothes don't get leprosy, but in the Torah they do. So clearly the word leprosy is not what we call leprosy. It's called, uh, how do you say, uh, metzoira or... Um, some kind, of, some kind of lesions which are white patches which appear on the skin, but they also appear on the walls of a house. Now, a bias manuga, again, has to be completely, uh, how do you say, um, discombobulated, taken to pieces, destroyed. These three, says one opinion, these lo hoya velo iye. They were never, never, never were, nor they will be. According to one of the Sanhedrin, so the question is, why, why, why are they there then? Why are they in the Torah if they're never going to be and they never will be? And the reason is, is because if you, if the sugi goes on to say that it comes out from the psukim, if you dash and if you learn out the halachas, there will never be a situation where all of the nitunim, the conditions, will be met in order to whatever. For example. It says that the Ben Sora Umora has to does not listen to the the voice of his father or the voice of his mother. The Gemara says that the parents have to have the same voice. If they don't have the same voice, then he's not a Ben Sora Umora. Now, if they do have the same voice, it means that the the, the mother must be an Ilonis, someone who never a woman, a woman a girl who never develops secondary sexual characteristics. And therefore, her voice starts to go low, like a man. So if her voice goes low like a man, then clearly she could never have, a, have had a child. So, according to this opinion, you will never have a Ben Zorim Moira. Because the Torah says that he didn't listen, he didn't hearken to the voice of his father, the voice of his mother. But if they have to have the same voice, okay. So, Beis Amanuga. So, without going into details, the walls have to be in a certain way that physically there could never be such a house. And by ir and idachas, that you have to burn the whole thing, so it's not shayach, it's not uh, possible that there wasn't a mezuzah somewhere in that city, and the Torah says that you have to burn everything, and of course you can't burn a mezuzah. So the Gemara says, if that's the case, then why? Why, oh why? Does the Torah write these, these, three, these three mitzvahs, if they're never going to happen, they can't happen? And the answer is, so that we, we can dourish, we can learn out, we can extrapolate, extrude, learn about these things, and we'll be makabal scha. We'll get reward for that. Says this of Rabbi Yisrael Talanta. Hang on a second. It's not enough that there are 610 mitzvahs for me to be makabal scha, that I can get scha from, from learning about these 610 other mitzvahs, 630 to, to three, I need three other ones which are never going to happen. I'm not going to get enough scha from learning about the other 610. Says, Rabbi Surah Salanta, the Torah wrote those three mitzvahs with one purpose, 
which was to teach that the purpose of the Torah is not necessarily to do it. Of course, if someone learns the Torah and he doesn't do what the Torah says, the, Torah, the Gemara says, better that he'd never been created in the first place. That's the worst thing in the world. But the Torah wrote these three mitzvahs to tell us that the ultimate purpose of limud, of learning Torah, is love dafka. It's not necessarily to do it. Because the Torah has within it the power to make us more spiritual, more holy. These are the parshas of Matan Torah, and the reason why I wanted to speak about this tonight is, is to we should understand what the Torah is, is at least a little bit. And uh, okay, that's it basically. Any questions? says that you should write these words on your heart doesn't mean literally uh, do a heart surgery and write them on your heart. Right. To absorb them spiritually. And I think maybe these mitzvahs also apply like you, know, you can't do these things with your face or like anything. I think how can it be taken into effect? And like the Rav said, how can we avoid these things but you know, the Yitzhahara develops through you know these ideas and this evil that we should avoid, that we like, you know, try to try not to see these things as like a grouping of things that we should avoid, maybe. Like these mitzvahs. The three mitzvahs you're talking about, which have no practical application. Correct. I mean, for sure that every mitzvah has different levels on it. There's a level of, uh, as you say, of, of. Uh, that you can take Musa from it, that you can learn from it a certain way of Hanhoga, a certain way of, of, of behaving. But that doesn't alter the fact that every mitzvah, theoretically, should have some practical application. If the Gemara says there is no practical... I mean, you're right, all of the things you're talking about are things that come after that. Given there's a mitzvah to... Uh, to, uh, to, let's say, engrave these words upon your heart, which means to live the, live the Torah, to take it, make it, part, make it part of you. So engraving something on your heart is, a, is maybe a way that you can understand how, at what level, that's supposed to affect you, the way you're supposed to relate to the Torah in that way. That's, but it, it has to have, a, a, at, the, at the bottom line, has to have a practical application. The point over here, there, there is no practical application. What you're talking about is like the superstructure, is like the, the cherry on the cake. But here there's no cake. There's no, no, no mitzvah to be done, uh, according to one opinion, because there's no possibility that you ever, ever could do it. So then wh why, why is it there? To be makabal schaf, fine, you have, ten, you have 600 and other mitzvahs that you could learn also, learn about them. But they also have a practical application. So Israel Salanda says a wonderful idea. That no, Davka the Torah is telling you by these three. That the Torah by itself, there's a Torah, so to speak, that exists apart from the mitzvahs, which is the ultimate hashbar, which is the ultimate kedusha, which is the ultimate way, the strongest way the, of, of achieving shlemus, which is the same as being Dovah Kineshem. Say that. Okay.